Tonight we're delighted to have uh, Clyde Smith, who is going to talk to us uh, about advances in the study of manufacturing drugs. This is something which is very close to my heart. The, there's nothing wrong with me at the moment, but I somehow feel things are going to go wrong at some stage. And the better the drugs are, the happier I'll be. So Clyde, thanks a lot. Keep up the good work. The Clyde um, has been here at Stanford for a year and a half now at the SSRL, which is our synchrotron radiation uh, laboratory here at SLAC, where they use uh, x-rays to look into a whole range of different uh, subjects. Prior to coming here, Clyde did uh, outstanding work in New Zealand. He's a New Zealander, as you'll probably guess when he starts to talk, the, uh, at the University of Auckland. And we're delighted that he decided to come uh, over here to join us at Slack. So, everybody, please welcome Clyde. Okay, is this on now? It is, great. Well, thank you all for uh, coming out and uh, attending my seminar. I hope you all go away taking something away from it. What I'm going to talk about is the way in which our science, the science that we do here, SSRL, protein crystallography, the way that it impinges on the way that drugs are designed. Now, the way that drugs are designed, I'll, I'll be going through this shortly, uh, is a long, drawn-out process, a very costly process. And we like to think that our science, our crystallography, can speed up that process from the beginning stages of drug design all the way through to development and then into uh, clinical trials. I'll be, try I'll be showing you some examples a little bit later on tonight about how that has been achieved and the speed in which it actually can be achieved. So this is what I aim to do, tell you first of all what protein crystallography is. It's a, probably a term you've, most people have never heard before. Drug design, uh, what that is, and what is the connection between these two, between our science and drug design. Show you some examples, show you a couple of examples uh, from the future, and then bring you down to earth again by talking a little bit about bacteria. Before we do that, we have to go down to the scale that we are talking about, and that scale is the atomic scale, which in this scale of things here is all the way down here. So this is where atoms reside, down on this range here. We generally look at things up in this range here, like ants, dust mites if we're lucky, or unlucky, pins. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that are from the natural world, which are on different scales, all the way from, like I said, the ant, down through to proteins, this is the protein complex here, all the way down to atoms. And in the man-made world, again, things that we can see with the naked eye pins, through devices which we need microscopes to look at, but which work as machines, all the way down to atoms once again. These are some iron atoms on a copper surface. So what I'm going to be talking about is way down here, even past this bottom line, down in this region. So atoms, what are they? Well, they're very small. They're about a tenth of a nanometer in diameter. So, like I said, right off the bottom of my scale here. The ones that we're interested in primarily when it comes to biology are these six here, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. These are the atoms that we normally would find in proteins and viruses and enzymes and bacteria and things like that. Living systems. We use a technique called protein crystallography to essentially see where these atoms are. And what I mean by see, I'll show you shortly, we don't actually see them as you would see things through a microscope or with the naked eye. But, we, but our technique, our computers, and our science allows us to pinpoint where the atoms are within a protein. So what is it we do? Well, we look at the three, first of all, we look at the 3D structure of proteins and enzymes. Knowing what they look like and where their atoms are then allows us to see how they interact with the things that they come into contact with in the cell every day, like small molecules or other proteins. And what we need to do that, first of all, is a sample of that protein or enzyme or virus or whatever the system is that we're looking at. We need an X-ray beam, we need lots of computers, and we need lots of time and lots of money. It's always the way in science. Some of you are probably asking the question already, okay, he's talking about proteins and enzymes and things. I have no idea what a protein is, except I read it on the back of like 
foods and tells me what the protein content is of that, of that food. What is a protein? Well, basically it's a chain of small molecules, small molecules called amino acids, that have all been joined together in a specific order. Now the order of those amino acids is very important. This is just a schematic representation of a protein. Don't worry about what the, number, the letters mean. We don't need to worry about it at this point. But basically different proteins, I'm talking about uh, the proteins in meat, muscle proteins, things like that. Uh, hair, for example, is a protein. I'm talking about different proteins, they all have a different sequence in which these amino acids are all joined up. Each protein also has a unique three-dimensional structure. No two proteins, or well, so long as there are no two different proteins anyway, will have the same structure. The structure, turns out, is dictated by what their sequence of amino acids is. And those two things, the sequence and the 3D structure, are then directly responsible for what that protein or what that enzyme does. So everything is linked together. But it's not as simple as just knowing the sequence to determine what the function is, or knowing the sequence to determine the structure. Or once you know the structure, you can get the function. It's not as simple as that. These things are all like quite intricately uh, interconnected, and we need to know a whole bunch of different stuff about the protein or the enzyme to know exactly what it is doing. Next question is, okay, we know, kind of know, hopefully, what a protein is, what it's made up of. What does it look like? Well, before we can answer that question, we also need to know what atoms look like. And there is a slight problem, because I represented some atoms like that, but of course, they're much, much smaller than that. In fact, you can't even see them. You can't see them with the naked eye, so we really don't know what atoms look like. But we do have some standard ways as crystallographers, as scientists, of representing what the atoms and the proteins look like. So this is one representation of a protein. This is what I call the blob model of the protein. So this, could, if you were small enough to go down and float around in solution, you might see the protein looking like a blob. This is a nice simple way that we like to represent the protein as a bunch of arrows joined up to a bunch of twisty screw things. I'm going to colour these up slightly differently shortly, and we'll, uh, I'll talk about them again. Right. There. So the purple things, you can see they're arrows, if I just let it rotate a little. These things are called beta strands. That's our scientific name for these. The curly blue things are called alpha helices, or alpha helix. And these are the two major building blocks of proteins, a beta strand and an alpha helix. And they are connected joined together by other pieces of protein to form our single protein molecule. Let's that rotate around a little bit. So that's our schematic representation. Any scientific paper you read that has a protein structure in it, you'll see that we've drawn it like that for simplicity. And now we can zoom in even closer and see it at the atomic level. Now this is another way we have of representing what protein looks like. We're now showing where the atoms are. So there's an atom at the end of that stick. That's a carbon atom in green. There's an atom here, this blue one, at the end of that stick. That's a nitrogen. There's another carbon there, another carbon there. This is an oxygen. So this is another way we have of representing proteins down at the atomic level. What we're actually showing in this diagram is the bond between two atoms, not the actual atom itself. But we can show the atoms if you want. We can let that change into an atomic model. So now. I've expanded my atoms up, so I'm now looking back at those spheres that I had before, whether that's a true representation or not, we don't know, but we're now looking at it in that sphere mode. Now I can zoom back out and show you that a protein structure in this visualization looks exactly the same as my blob model, because there it is again, back at the start. So that's our various ways of representing protein structure, and you'll be seeing some more of these tonight, and hopefully it'll all sink in by the end of the evening. Okay, so the question is, well, the questions are, what are proteins? I've answered it. What do they look like? Well, we have ways of showing it. Why do we do this science here at Stanford, and why do we do it here at the synchrotron? The answer to, the answer to that is, well, we need the X-ray beam, as I said before. The X-ray beams that we generate or we produce here in the synchrotron lab are about 1,000 to maybe 10,000 times brighter than you can get in a university lab or a drug company lab or something like that. So we have very, very bright x-rays. 
We can also choose the wavelength of the x-rays, which can be important for some of the experiments that we do. Whereas in a lab setting, you're fixed at one wavelength. We also have the money, thanks to the Department of Energy and the National Institute of Health, to buy state-of-the-art equipment. The equipment that we have on our beam lines and the synchrotron are the latest and greatest things. And of course, we had the best people in the world working here, and there's a number of them scattered around in the audience. For those of you who've been to uh, some of these uh, public lectures before, you may have seen this, um, this slide. This is a schematic of how the synchrotron works. And if I'm lucky, I might be able to, can I get it to show it again? I'll go back. Okay. So this is a schematic of how the synchrotron works. We have electrons which are brought up to close to the speed of light by a booster synchrotron, inserted into our ring, which we call the spear ring, and that produces x-rays, and the x-rays are passed down beam lines into what we call the hutch area, and that is the, the place where we do our experiment. And what I'm going to do now is take you on another virtual tour of what an experimental beam line looks like, one of our ones over here. So this is what you see as you come into our beam line. You see a whole bunch of computers and electronic equipment and everything, and you see a big lead door with a window in it. So let's take a look through that window. You see there's behind that window a whole bunch of equipment, scientific equipment, electrical equipment. We'll open up the door and walk in, and the first thing you run into as you walk into this hutch, this beam line, is our X-ray detector, which is this big white thing here. Our sample is around the corner, so we'll just take a little walk around the corner, and this is where we place our sample. X-rays are coming along in this direction. I'll show a close-up view in a second. And our X-ray detector, which is back over here now, detects the X-rays from our sample. That's a close-up view of where we put our sample, so the sample's not on there at the moment, but it would sit right on this magnetic uh, end here. The X-rays come out this tube, this is a liquid nitrogen cryostat, which keeps our samples cold. The detector is way downstream over here. There's a picture of our sample now sitting on our beam line. The sample is right down at the end of this piece of copper, piece of steel. So the sample is right in there. Too small, to, almost too small to see with the naked eye as well. We have TELUS microscopes that allow us to see where it is. And the sample, which is something I haven't mentioned yet, are crystals. Hence the term protein crystallography, the crystals of protein. And so here are some examples from our lab over the past little while of some of the crystals that people have worked on. Now these are held in a loop and frozen at liquid nitrogen temperature, which allows them to sort of stay in the X-ray beam for a reasonable length of time because, as with all living things, these things don't like X-rays. So you fire X-rays at a protein and you're going to disrupt it. But we freeze them down to liquid nitrogen and they stay for I'll answer questions at the end if that's okay. Okay, so crystals. That's our sample. Why are they so important? In a crystal, what we have are a whole bunch of atoms, maybe tens of thousands, maybe billions of atoms, all lined up in a regular repeating pattern. So if I take a molecule or an object of some sort, such as this flag from well-known South Pacific nation, and make a two-dimensional lattice or two-dimensional repeating array of that, I get that. That's, that's a nice two-dimensional repeating pattern of the New Zealand flag. And we can label axes if we want to A and B. We don't necessarily need to do that. What we can now do is take that slice, if you like, those six flags, and stack them all up in 3D. I'm only looking 2D now. We can look into the board and out of the board and stack them up in 3D, and we end up with what we term a crystal. We have a regular repeating array of identical molecules, all lined up so that they're in the same orientation. Now there's the important thing. I'm gonna turn that now into something a little bit more uh, simplistic, and that this is a lattice, a three-dimensional lattice, with maybe an atom at each corner, maybe not, a lattice point at each corner. When you fire an X-ray beam at something such as this with a regular repeating pattern to it, and the atoms within, inside the crystal bend the x-rays to some extent. 
I'm going to fire my X-ray beam at this lattice, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of little X-rays come firing off. And this is a term known as diffraction. So any physicists in the audience? It gives rise to very weak X-ray beams. These things are very, very weak. If you've only got a few atoms in your crystal, you're not going to be able to see it. But the good thing about these crystals is that we have so many atoms, so many copies of each atom or molecule within that crystal that the diffracted beams get amplified, so we're able to actually detect them with one of these big X-ray detectors that we have. We get what is termed a diffraction pattern. So this is the way the experiment works. You take your crystal, and it's going to come on here in a second. We have a robot mounting system which is going to put it on for us. So here's our crystal arriving at our sample position. You fire a beam of X-rays at that crystal while it is rotating, and you'll see it rotate shortly. It's not a complete rotation as we do in our experiment, but you can see that it's moving. And then you record all of those diffracted X-ray beams that come out of it with our X-ray detector, and you get something that looks a little bit like this. This is a standard, typical diffraction pattern from our, one of our detectors. I have a movie that kind of shows in schematic representation what, we, what takes place. So here's our crystal rotating, our X-ray beam. Not sure which way the X-ray beam's coming in, maybe from this side here, X-ray beam. And we get this type of pattern. We don't actually see it moving like that. These are, this is a sped up movie of all of the snapshots that we would take over the course of our experiment. And you may rotate the crystal by 360 degrees and take a shot every half degree, maybe. And you'll collect a pattern which looks, you know, if you compare the two patterns side by side, they may look similar to each other. But you can see that the pattern is changing as we rotate the crystal. Okay, so that's our science. That's the way we do it. And how useful actually is it? Well, here are some notable achievements that our science of protein crystallography has come up with over the years. I'm not sure, that, I don't think the time scale is relevant here because these two molecules, myoglobin and hemoglobin, their structures were determined in the late 1950s. But as you can see, we've started with small molecules because they were the easiest ones to deal with. And we've actually worked our way up to some rather large complex molecules. These are all to scale. This is a virus. This is the ribosome which is the machinery in our cells that makes protein. These two molecules here are involved in muscle contraction. This is actin, which is one of the filaments in our muscle. And this is myosin, which is on one of the other filaments in our muscle, which allows the muscle filaments to move past each other. This structure, the data for that structure, was actually determined, uh, calc collected here at, uh, at our synchrotron a few years ago. There's one thing that you might think is missing from that slide, and that is, of course, the structure of DNA, because that is one of the most famous structures of a biological molecule that was determined with our science, protein, uh, crystallography. The reason I've left it out, this is not really a protein, but it does need to have a mention, of course, because, as I said, it was the first structure that was determined. So this is Watson and Crick looking at their model for the double helix of DNA, which I'm sure uh, most of you have seen before. So they got the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1962 for that, along with a guy called Morris Wilkins, who turns out to be a New Zealander. So that's his photograph there. <laughs> and this is their raw data, if you like. This is what they saw when they did their diffraction experiment. We see, we see lots of discrete points on our X-ray detector. They see lines and smears and smudges. But they were able to determine that a double helix was the structure within the crystal that gave rise to that diffraction pattern. And they did it all basically by thinking about it, figuring out what, it, what structure would actually give rise to that diffraction pattern. Nowadays, we get computers to do the thinking for us. This is uh, the photograph that was taken when they got their Nobel Prize. So let me see if I can figure out who's who. That's Wilkins, and that's Crick and Watson there. Uh, it's John Steinbeck in the middle. He got the prize for literature that year. These two guys here are also very important in terms of our science protein crystallography. They got the Nobel Prize that year for chemistry, and they are Max Perutz and John Kendrew, and they got the prize because they determined the first protein structures. And around about the same time, around about the late 50s, they did all this work. They determined the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin, again, using our technique of protein crystallography. So these are the forerunners, if you like, in protein crystallography. 
Okay, now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and tell you a little bit about drugs and how they're designed, and then how we can help with our science. First thing that makes a drug a drug is that there has to be something that it interacts with in the cell. There has to be what we term a target. So whether that cell is a virus or a bacteria or a cancer cell or something, there has to be something in that cell that we can aim a drug at which is going to do something useful, like kill the cell. That's always a good thing. The drug has to also be able to reach that target. It has to be able to pass through membranes and pores. And these are all things that scientists have to keep in mind when they're trying to design something. You can't make something that is completely insoluble or is huge because it's not going to get to where it has to go. It might be the best drug ever for its target, but if it's not going to get there, it's no good. And on the way, the drug also has to remain intact. It can't be deactivated. And there are big problems at the moment uh, with this, which I'll come to at the end of the talk. This is a bacterial cell, and these are some of the processes that take place within the bacterial cell. And some of these words you know, are really meaningless to, to most people, uh, meaningless to me in most cases. But most, all bacterial cells have DNA. They don't have a nucleus, but they do have a defined area where the DNA likes to reside. So I've sort of drawn around it in gray. DNA is turned into RNA. Now, I like to think of DNA as like a book in a library that has all the information. And the RNA are the photocopies that people can make when they go into the library, make a copy and take it away to do something with it later on. So you've got the standard copy of the genetic code sitting somewhere, and then you can make a whole bunch of different copies of it and do things with them, and that's the RNA. The process to do that is called transcription. The RNA then gets turned into protein by this big machine here, which is a, a combination of RNA and protein. That's called the ribosome. That process is translation. We get a protein out at the end, and the protein is the thing, are the things, proteins and enzymes are the things that do processes within a living cell. They do the reactions, or they're there for structural purposes, things like that. And then, and amongst all the soup that is in the rest of the cell, are all these biochemical reactions taking place. Now, if you want to design a drug, there are various steps here, of a drug that's going to kill the cell, there are various stages here that you can aim your drug at. You can aim it at DNA or transcription, and quinolones are an example of a family of drugs that are, have been designed to interfere with that. You can interfere with the turning of the RNA into protein. Uh, tetracycline, which is a drug that some people may have heard of, is an example of a drug that does that. It's been designed to do that. Interfere with the ribosome, stop it from working. You can interfere with the processes that the cell requires to stay alive. Um, sulfonamides are a very old family of drugs, and they're an example of that. Methotrexate is an anti-cancer drug, which is also a good antibiotic. That's another example of that. Or one drug that I'm sure you've all heard of, penicillin, is aimed at something slightly different. It's aimed at the cell wall. Now, bacteria are unique in that they have a cell wall which other cells, animal cells, plant cells, don't have. So if you can make something that's going to knock out the cell wall or stop it from being formed properly when these things reproduce, then you're going to have a very, very potent antibiotic. And that's what penicillin used to be. It still is a, a viable drug, but there are problems with it, as, again, as I'll point out later on. How do we develop and design drugs? Well, the way it was done initially was by luck. And I'm sure you've all heard, well, some of you have heard of the story of Fleming and how he found penicillin. He came back from holiday and found that, I'll tell you later, <laughs> came, back, came back from holiday and he found that a plate of bacteria that he'd left out had, there's a fungal spore, some fungus had grown on it, and around where that fungus was, the bacteria had all died, there was no bacteria there. So he figured, oh, maybe there's something that, well, actually, was it him? No, it wasn't him who figured it out. It was a couple of guys a few years later figured that there was something that came out of that fungal spore that was killing the bacteria. Maybe well, that might be a useful thing to you know, fight bacteria in a living system. That's how penicillin was developed. Sulfonamides, or sulfur drugs as they're called, um, were initially made as dyes by a German company, and they found this blue stuff actually killed bacteria. So then they thought, okay, maybe we could give that to people if they you know, have bacterial infections, and they, they work, and there's, there's still some of them around today. This guy called Waxman who was looking for unique and strange molecules in soil, and he came up with a whole bunch of molecules that turned out to kill bacteria. 
And these things, streptomycin is a good example, these molecules are made by soil bacteria to fight off other soil bacteria. So if you can imagine in a little spoonful of soil, there's a whole bunch of bacteria all having a war against each other, firing these chemicals at each other, killing each other, but you know, they're immune to their own uh, antibiotic, hopefully. And this guy was able to extract a few of these uh, molecules out and streptomycin became the first one of these. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones uh, that have been developed over the years. Of course, I've stopped at 61. The list explodes after that. With the exception of the sulfur drugs and methotrexate, uh, most of the early drugs were derived from natural sources, plants, you know, uh, seaweeds, fungus, insects, things like that. But then drug companies came along and things were about to change. The way that drug companies uh, tend to do their drug development is they first of all form a, a biological hypothesis. I want to kill a bacteria. I want to cure cancer. I want to cure the common cold, things like that. So they come up with a hypothesis and then figure out if there's a target that they can uh, aim at and then figure out what any drug is actually going to do to that biological process. Then they have to design an assay for it so they can actually see whether their drug that they make is working or not. And then they start making their compounds. They make something called a lead compound, which is the first compound that they come up with. They test that compound. If it doesn't work, they make some more, maybe based upon the first one or maybe something completely different. If it does work, they ask the question, can it be made to work better? They optimize that lead compound, they change it, they add things to it, they take things off, etc. And over the years, drug companies have built up vast libraries of molecules that they have their hands on that they can, when they start a new project, they can reach with well, this 100,000 molecules and test those, or well, this sample of, you know, subset of molecules and test those. It's all done in vitro, it's all done in a lab, in a test tube. It's called either combinatorial chemistry or medicinal chemistry. That's design. Development doesn't actually start until they have a molecule and they put it into clinical trials. Typically, it can take anywhere between 10 and 15 years to start with a biological hypothesis and work your way through to a viable drug. That's quite a long time. Most of the molecules, like 99 or more percent of them, fail along the way, but they still have those molecules and they can use them for other things, that's not bad. But the estimated cost now to bring a drug to market is about just under a billion dollars, 800 million. It's quite a lot. So, can we do, as scientists, as protein crystallographers, can we do anything to help? And, yeah, the answer is yes, we can. Because we, because we look at the three-dimensional structure of proteins, see where the atoms are, etc., we can see how they interact with other molecules and cells, I've mentioned that before. But we also can figure out how these proteins and enzymes are working. And if they're from something nasty, we can figure out how to stop them from working, which is what drug design is all about anyway. But we can do it a little bit faster. So molecules can be designed to stop the, these enzymes from working properly. If the enzyme is crucial to the bacteria, then it will kill the bacteria, and then we have a drug. Hopefully. So the way that we do it as crystallographers is we determine the 3D structure of proteins. We look at what the protein looks like, where the atoms are, where various compounds might bind to that, where it interacts with other cells. We can design some lead compounds as well, same way the drug companies do. We can make improvements, optimize the lead compound. But we do all our improvements with computer graphics. We don't go anywhere near the test tube at this point. So everything's done on the computer. And hopefully out comes a drug in a fraction of the time and in a fraction of the cost. That's the idea anyway. So I'm going to go through some examples now. The first two examples are very famous examples um, of how our science has sped things up considerably when it's come to designing drugs. And the other two examples are a couple of examples I want to look at. Okay, the influenza virus. Influenza virus is an RNA, it's termed an RNA virus, and that it carries RNA around inside a protein coat. The protein coat and the RNA form what we call a virion. I'll be using this term a couple of times, so I thought I'd introduce it. 
If you look really closely at an influenza virus, through a microscope hopefully, you will see that it has a whole bunch of little spikes that stick out from the surface, and they are made of protein, and there are two different types. And this slide isn't the best one to show this, but there's one type, which is just a spike called the HA protein. I'm not going to worry about the real name of it, it's too huge and long. Then there's another spike which looks like a little flattened mushroom. You can see one right there, which is called termed the NA protein. And they have various jobs in terms of how, they, how the virus infects the cell, how it gets in, how it gets out. Here's a schematic representation of a blue virus. So this is the HA protein. It uses these molecules to bind to a lung cell. And this is the NA protein. It uses these molecules to eat its way in and eat its way back out again. These molecules have identical binding sites on them, and they recognize a molecule on the lung surface called sialic acid. So the HA protein has sialic acid binding sites. The NA protein has sialic acid binding sites, but it also chops that molecule off from the surface and then pushes its way in. These molecules, these protein molecules on the surface of of flu virus become important when we look at the different strains of virus that are present today. So there are three different types of virus. C and B types of influenza aren't very bad. Okay. The C form is very mild. The B form sometimes causes outbreaks, but it's very easy to clean up. The reason that is because they only have one type of HA molecule, one type of NA molecule, so our immune system has probably already seen these molecules before and has antibodies for them already. So we have no problem mopping up these types of influenza when they attack our system. It's the A strain or the A type of the virus which is the one that causes all these pandemics around the world. Like the 1918 Spanish flu, for example, was an A strain virus. It killed 20 million people, which is twice as many as, would, as died in the First World War. So it's, this is a killer. This, this is deadly. Why is it more deadly than the other strains? Well, I've probably given you a clue already when I'm talking about the different types of HA and NA molecules present. The A strain of flu has 13 different possible HA molecules it can use, and, the NA, and nine different NA molecules it can use. So it can chop and change these molecules and display different ones on the surface. So that it tricks your, well, it doesn't actually trick your immune system, it just like, wipes it out completely. It has no your immune system has no way of dealing with these new molecules. It's never seen them before. It has to go through the process of making antibodies, which takes a while. The way this happens is a process known as gene swapping. So we could have one virus, an H1N1, an H3N7, both infecting a cell at the same time. Gene swapping occurs. They get together and they say, I'll swap you. Oh, give me that one. I'll, I'll give you that one. Out comes H1N7, which is a completely new virus. No one's ever seen it before. It's going to kill a whole bunch of people somewhere, probably. And H3N1, which may also be another deadly virus. The 1918 virus was H1N1. In 1957, gene swapping had occurred over those years. H2N2 appeared and killed thousands in this country. 68, a different one came out. H3N2 appeared. It was still mild. It was, it was quite mild, but it was still a killer. And then the scary thing happened. In 76, H1N1 came back, but it was able to be contained on an airbase somewhere here in the US. I can't remember where it was. Protein that we're interested in, in terms of crystallography, in terms of drug design, is one of these surface proteins. And it's the NA protein. There's its real name, neuraminidase. There are four identical molecules of this molecule sticking out from the surface. Protein. And each one binds one molecule of sialic acid there, 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 and there. A good idea would be to make an inhibitor of this molecule, and then the virus wouldn't have any way of getting into the cell. It'd be able to bind to the cell with its HA molecule, but then it'd be stuck there. It couldn't eat its way in, because this molecule is the one that it uses for that. So if you could design something that stops this enzyme from working, you'd have a drug flu. And that's just exactly what people in Australia thought, that they would design an inhibitor for this molecule NA. So here's my NA molecule rotating around, and I'm going to zoom in on one of these units, one of these molecules in a second, and show you what the active site looks like. There we go. So we're going to zoom in here. 
So here I have one in a molecule looking right into its active site now and looking at substrate. This is sialic acid sitting in the binding site. What the researchers did was they changed this molecule a little bit and turned it into what we term an inhibitor. Now, an inhibitor is a molecule which binds in the same place but stops the enzyme from working. The reason it does that is normally because once the enzyme's bound that molecule, it can't release it, so it can't continue its job properly. So it can design an inhibitor, and it could look like that, for example. What we've done is add some extra atoms up onto this top piece here and just take off an atom. So that now becomes an inhibitor of this enzyme. Could be a potential drug. Turns out this is a very, very famous story and a very good way of illustrating the strength of, our, the, of the work that we do. This is a schematic now of the binding site of, of the Na molecule with uh, sialic acid bound in it. Sialic acid bound in the binding site. You can see there's a big hole down here which is surrounded by negative charge. They saw that from the structure of the, of the protein. They made an inhibitor. They just changed things a little bit. You can see that all that's changed is this oxygen's altered slightly and we've lost a OH from here. But we still weren't really attacking that negative pocket. This was an inhibitor. Uh, this number here is reasonable, 1,000 nanomolar. Remember that number because I'm going to show you some more of these numbers a bit later on. So that's reasonable, but it's still probably quite a weak inhibitor. Now concentrated on this, pot, on this negatively charged pocket here, if we were to add something that had a positive charge to the end of that molecule, this molecule might bind tighter in there because there'd be that attraction between the positive and the negative. This is exactly what the researchers were thinking. So they made this molecule, which just had three, they took off the OH, added four extra atoms here, and it became a drug. You can see it's 10,000 times better than this molecule. The smaller the number, the better. So it's 10,000 times smaller in this number, Ki. This drug is what's known as Relenza, which is a drug that you can buy from Flexo Welcome to stop flu. It's not very soluble, so you need to um, actually administer it by inhalation. So you have a little puffer thing, take it into your lungs. This is probably the best example, the most excellent example anyway, of the speed in which you can design a drug using structure-based drug design, because only two molecules are actually ever synthesized. Sialic acid was the substrate, didn't have to make that. They made that first inhibitor, they made the second one, the second one turned out to be the drug. So you can imagine how quick that was and hopefully how cheap that was. Well, I'm sure uh, Blackso are charging some money for that. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next example which is HIV and AIDS. Here are some statistics that, you know, people know all about AIDS, HIV and AIDS, how bad it is. Currently 40 million people are infected, 5 million people every year, there's 5 million new cases every year, 3 million people die. It's estimated about 11 out of every 1,000 people are infected by HIV. 20 million have died since it was discovered. So it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a killer. This is a schematic or an you know, artist's impression of what HIV virus looks like, the human immunodeficiency virus. This is a blow up, and it's got a whole bunch of terms in here we don't need to worry too much about. But the thing to note is that it also has these molecules which stick out from the surface. And in this case, they're called GP120. And these molecules, the two things that are important about this molecule, that for our, from our point of view anyway, is that it is an RNA virus, it carries RNA around inside of it, and it also has these spikes which are used to attach the molecule to cells. So most viruses are gonna look like this, they're gonna have these things that allow them to attach to cells. So how does it work? Or how does it infect a cell, I should say? So it binds, first of all, using this GP120 molecule to a receptor on the surface of a cell. We don't need to worry exactly what receptor it is. It then gets internalized or pulled into the cell and releases all of its contents. And that, those contents are RNA. So those black strands there are RNA. It comes with its own enzyme which turns RNA into DNA, which was reverse transcriptase. So it now makes a DNA copy of its RNA and then does the nasty little 
thing of inserting its piece of DNA into the DNA of the cell that it's just invaded. And then, it uses, then it's taken over the cell, basically. It now uses the cell's own machinery to make more RNA copies of itself, which then come out of the nucleus. It then uses the cell's ribosomes to make protein from that RNA. So there's the cell's ribosome making protein. You'll see it go backwards and forwards a couple of times. Making a few different proteins. And it makes something at the end called a protease. That's the purple one. So just watch what the protease does. All these molecules then line up at the surface. Protease then comes along and chops up the protein so it's ready to be put inside another virus molecule, a new one that it's, that's been formed and sent out into the wide world to infect another cell. So this is virus reproduction. Here comes a new mature virus off to infect another cell. So they go through the whole process again. So there are drug targets. Of course there are drug targets. The most obvious targets are the reverse transcriptase, and some of you may have heard of the drug AZT, which is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It stops that enzyme from working. That's one way of, of killing the, the HIV. There are drugs that are being developed for the integrase, which is the enzyme that pushes the DNA into the host DNA or the cell's DNA. But the one that we're interested in from a, a uh, wrong button, from a structure-based design point of view is the protease, the enzyme that finishes off by chopping the molecule up so it's ready to go. So some protease inhibitors were designed based upon the protein structure of HIV protease. Before we even knew what the structure looked like, we knew what sort of protease it was. There are, there are certain types, there are different types of protease. This was what's termed an aspartic protease. Doesn't matter exactly what that means. But because we scientists knew more or less what it would look like, they were able to design something before the structure even came out. So this is not really structure-based design. So some lead compounds were designed. This was the first one that was approved by the FDA. So quinavir, it's called Inverase by Hoffman LaRoche, who sell it. That's the first one that ever came out, but it was designed without the structure. All subsequent drugs, and there are more than 10, maybe 10 to 15 of these drugs now, were designed once the structure was known, based upon what the binding site for this molecule and for the substrate looked like. So there's the quinavir again, sitting in the binding site of HIV protease. I've zoomed in. Oh, this is HIV protease molecule here, in purple and yellow. I'm zoomed in slightly here. Here's another one, indinavir, or Crixavan, sold by Merck. It also binds in exactly the same spot, which is between these purple and yellow molecules here. There's over 100 protease inhibitor structures now that are available for us, like scientists, to look at and you know, maybe design more in the future. But they are, they're all out there in the public domain. Anyone can go and look at these things. Here's another one, nalfinavir, which is sold as Vericept, which some people, you know, I've, I've heard of that name before I started reading all this, sold by Pfizer. And here's another bunch of them. You can see that all the big drug companies have got their little fingers into this pie because it's a very lucrative area to be in. Pfizer, Abbott, Bristol-Myers, etc. And they're all designed using the protease structure. So here is the protease. It consists of two identical molecules which are kind of wrap around each other like that. So it's a, it's a symmetrical molecule. The binding site is sandwiched in between. And there's the drug binding site there. I'm just zoomed in on it. So that's one drug bound in the active site of HIV protease. There's another one. These are upjohn um, inhibitors, the ones I'm showing you now. They haven't actually made it to the market yet. What was noticed, for, of course, when they looked at the structure, was that the binding site was symmetrical because it consists of these two identical molecules that have come together like that. So the binding site is symmetrical. So they figured, OK, maybe we could make symmetrical inhibitors. So here, DuPont came up with a range of symmetrical inhibitors based upon the cyclic structure to bind into that binding site. And that is what one of the DuPont protease inhibitors looks like in the binding site of HIV protease. Okay, on to the future. The two things I want to talk about in the future, uh, 
tar drug design targets are drugs that will help us fight anthrax, and a little bit later, we'll talk about cancer. So we're going to design some, we'll look at ways in which people are now thinking about designing some anthrax toxin inhibitors. Anthrax, of course, is a disease which can affect humans. It's normally a disease of cattle and deer caused by the bacteria Bacillus anthracis. It's 100% lethal if you, un if you don't treat it. So that's why it is of so much importance. The other reason it's of so much relevance, I won't say importance, but I'll say relevance, is that it could be used in bioterrorism. It could be a biological weapon. It would make a very good biological weapon. It's going to kill everyone. How does it work? How does it kill? Well, it releases a toxin which is composed of three proteins, something called the protective antigen, something called the lethal factor, which sounds pretty nasty, and something called the edema factor, which doesn't sound too healthy either. This is the process by which anthrax toxin gets into the cell. So first of all, protective antigen binds to something, a receptor or something on the a molecule on the cell that's going to infect. It forms into a ring-like structure and Using, and then either edema factor or lethal factor then bind to that ring-like structure and get dragged down into the cell and then released out into the uh, solution that's within the cell. When the cell dies, and it eventually will, once these things are inside it, all of those things, the lethal factor and the edema factor, are released into the bloodstream. And at that point, you can't cure this disease by killing the bacteria because you've got lethal factor, you've got edema factor all within your system. There's no way you can kill it. The only way you can kill this disease is by getting it when it's still a bacteria or targeting some of these molecules when it's still only infected a few cells. This is what protective antigen looks like. I said it formed a ring, so you can see there it's a nice ring-like structure composed of seven identical molecules. The PA, the protective antigen, is in green, yellow, and red, and this blue molecule is a part of the molecule it sticks to on the surface. So they've managed to chop that off as well and incorporate that into the structure. And this is a schematic of what they think it looks like. They really only have this part as the structure. This is what they think the stalk looks like coming out of the cell, and this is how it sits on the surface of a cell, ready to pull down the lethal factor and the edema factor within the cell. This is lethal factor composed of several parts, as you can see. The important parts are where it binds to protective antigen. It has to be able to bind to that before it can get sucked in. And the place where it does its job, because this is an enzyme. Once it gets into the cell, it does something. It does something pretty nasty in that it binds to a specific part of an enzyme called a kinase enzyme within the cell. And kinases are like ubiquitous enzymes. They're all over the place. They're within every cell but the enzymes that are involved in signal transduction, transferring signals from one place to another. And they're also used in the immune system. So what would happen when I mean, a cell gets infected by a bacteria, it would send out a signal using kinases to the immune system and say, come and help me, I'm being infected. What this lethal factor does is it stops this signaling from working by chopping this molecule up. So the signal can't get out to the immune system, the immune system has no idea that the cell has been taken over by anthrax toxin, so the immune system can't fight it. So the lethal factor, the edema factor build up, the cell dies, these things are spewed into our system. This is lethal factor, again it's composed of two molecules, two identical molecules which are stuck together, and each one, each molecule has its own binding site, you can see it right at the top here, I'm going to zoom in on one of those in a second, I'll just flip it over. So that's the binding site of lethal factor where it binds to this kinase enzyme. What I'm showing here is a portion of the kinase enzyme. The scientists have made a small portion of it and seen how that binds into the active site. They've also then gone ahead and started to design some inhibitors. So there's one molecule in red, another one in cyan, another one in magenta. The process so far then. They've looked at this 20 amino acid piece that came from the kinase and figured out how that fits into the binding site. I've then gone on to look at some small pieces of that sequence. So this is just three amino acids. And they saw, okay, it's not a very good inhibitor. It does inhibit a little bit. 11,000 is not a very good number. You saw before I had 0.1 for Relenza, for example. 
So we're aiming for something around about one to be a good drug. There's a commercially available inhibitor of this type of enzyme, which they tried, and it was hard to read on the board. 2100 was the number. So, you know, we're getting down smaller numbers, but it's still not a particularly good inhibitor. Then they've designed something more recently that fits into that binding site, and it has a value of 500. Again, it's still not the best inhibitor, but that's kind of where we are at the moment in terms of designing something to fight anthrax toxin lethal factor. The last thing I want to mention briefly is cancer. Are there ways that we can use our science to look at some targets uh, which could be uh, targets for cancer drugs. There's one example that I've been uh, involved with in the University of Auckland, and that is looking at what's termed the cell cycle. The problem with cancer cells is that they basically are human cells. So they're not like bacteria, which you can design something that's going to be specific. Anything you design to attack a cancer cell is going to attack all the other human healthy cells around it. So you have to be a little bit tricky. You have to look at something that the cancer cell does that human cells either don't do or do to a very small extent. Looking at the cell cycle, it turns out that cancer cells, because they control, they divide uncontrollably, lack careful checking of the DNA replication process. So they end up with a few errors in their DNA. And maybe we can use that. One idea is to stop the checks. There are checks that does take place. There are some checks. One idea is to actually stop the checks in a rapidly reproducing cancer cell so that mutations then accelerate in the DNA of the, of the cancer cell, the cancer cell will hopefully die. That's one possibility. The targets for this are, once again, these enzymes called kinases. As I said, they're ubiquitous. They're all over the place. They're used to control the checkpoints of the cell cycle. So if you can disrupt them, maybe you can disrupt the checks Maybe the DNA will become more mutated and the cancer cell will die. So we need to look for some kinase inhibitors which could pretend to be potential anti-cancer drugs. This is the kinase that we were interested in. Kinases all look the same, so anyone who knows what a kinase looks like will recognize that. I'm going to zoom in now on the active site. This is actually the site in which the molecule binds a very important substrate. And that substrate is a molecule called ATP, which is the universal energy source or energy store molecule in living systems. We all have ATP flowing through us. It's used for muscle contraction, for keeping our brain working and all that sort of thing. That's what ATP looks like. What it does, what this enzyme does, it transfers the phosphate, a phosphate group, which is just this piece on the end here, it chops that off and transfers it onto another enzyme and switches that enzyme on. It's like a little key that it plugs into the other enzyme, switches it on. That enzyme then goes away and maybe does the same thing to another enzyme. So you get this cascade of enzymes all doing these things. That's how you can transfer signals from one point to another. So some molecules were designed to fit into that binding site and maybe block where ATP binds. That seemed to be a reasonably robust sort of idea at the time. That would hopefully disrupt the normal cell cycle and we would get death of the cancer cell. So here's a molecule sitting in the ATP binding site of our kinase. There's another one. You can see we've changed things a little bit, made bits that stick out to the side. There's some more. We've got bits that are now sticking out towards us. What we're going to do now is flip over this molecule and chop off some layers of the protein and look into the binding site and see what we've actually been thinking the way that our drug design has actually developed. You can see we have quite a large patch of space out here we could occupy with something that might make it bind tighter. We have a hole here which we could occupy that might make it bind tighter. That's what we're trying to do with drug design. Fit little bits of atoms into pockets that are going to grip onto the molecule and make it bind tight. If you can make it bind tight, ATP can't get in, enzyme's dead. You've killed it. So maybe we could Head out in that direction, find something into here, or maybe down into this direction. And these are all drugs that were designed, and these are all real structures that we determined. It hasn't turned into a drug yet. 
We're still working on it. Okay, the important question then is raised. Almost at the end now. Since we're getting so good at this, you know, you saw how long it, it didn't take very long to make that flu drug. We're really good at this type of thing. We can look at these structures and say, I know what molecule I could fit into there and then make something. Why do we have to continually make new drugs? Why can't we just have one drug for each disease and it kills it completely? The answer is, of course, drug resistance. Resist bacteria become resistant to the drug that we are feeding them. I mentioned penicillin was thought of as a wonder drug when it was first developed all through World War II. It was used, used clinically first in 1940 during World War II. Before the end of that war, there were strains of bacteria that were resistant to penicillin. They'd never seen penicillin before. Penicillin had only just been made. But there were strains of bacteria that were resistant to it. Something like 80% of all Staphylococcus aureus strains that today are resistant to penicillin. They weren't when penicillin first came out. Streptomycin, that other one that I mentioned that was taken from soil, became the first drug that was found to be clinically useful against tuberculosis. Before that, tuberculosis killed you if you got it, basically. There's no cure for tuberculosis. This thing was the first cure for tuberculosis, 1943. Two years later, there were resistant strains of TB. In the 80s, it was thought that TB had been wiped out completely and that there was no, no one is gonna, ever going to be infected by TB ever again. But by the early 90s, there, even more new strains had emerged which were resistant to the drugs that were then in use. Streptomycin wasn't one of the drugs that had already been wiped out, got rid of. You thought HIV sounded bad, you should listen to TB. 2004 statistics on TB, a third of the world's population is infected by it. That's two billion people have TB. Luckily, TB can sit in your system for 20, 30, 40 years and not do anything and kill you when your immune system gets depressed a little bit later. That's why people are infected, but they don't actually show it. There are 40 million newly infected people every year. That's the same number of people who are infected by HIV, but there's new cases, these are new cases of TB every year. But it doesn't kill as many people as HIV. It kills, you know, it's two millions a lot, but it's because it has this latent form where it can sit in your lung for many, many years. There's an entire family of drugs that have now become clinically useless called the aminoglycosides. Again, its resistance has built up over the years. Staphylococcus aureus, as I mentioned before, is a common type of bacteria, normally easily treatable. Methicillin was almost deemed the second wonder drug, if you like. It's based upon penicillin, but it killed everything. There are now cases where people are seeing methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. It's appearing and it's killing thousands of people. So what's going on? As I mentioned, it's resistance, resistance to antibiotics, and the bacteria have developed a whole bunch of different ways in which they can become resistant to a particular antibiotic. Even if they've never seen it before, they will become resistant within a couple of years. It's inevitable. Any new drug that comes on the market now, well, you'll find resistance to it in a year or two. They do it by various ways. In the case of penicillin, they just refuse to take the drug up anymore. They just close down the pores that were taking up penicillin decrease the uptake. In the case of tetracyclines, you get the drug into the, into the cell, but it's flushed straight back out again because they have elevated or accelerated their drug removal systems. You can get alteration of the target. And as I said, there always has to be a target. It's a molecule, an enzyme that you target with this inhibitor, and it stops it dead. Bacteria change the target. They alter the target. They mutate the target so that the drug no longer binds properly and doesn't do its job but the target that the enzyme still works, that's the important thing. If there's a metabolic step that the bacteria requires for life and you hit it with a drug, what the bacteria does, it bypasses that step. It says, I don't need that step anymore, I'll do, it in, I'll do that reaction a different way, which isn't affected by that drug. So that's a replacement metabolic step. And then the big one, this, is, this last um, one here is the one that counts for most resistance these days, is that the drug is modified. You remember right back at the start I said if you want to have a viable drug, it can't be modified before it gets to the target. But that's exactly what bacteria do. They change the drug. They add something to it, they chop it up, they take something off. And these are some enzymes, structures that have been determined over the years, which do exactly that to a drug. This is an enzyme that
that changes an amino glycoside. It adds on another group to it. Make, no longer gets into the cell, no longer does the job. This is another enzyme that adds a phosphate group, a simple little phosphate group to the drug, stops it working completely. This is an enzyme that chops penicillin, it's called beta-lactamase. So, what's the take-home point from that then? Is that bacteria and viruses are a lot cleverer than we are, most probably. And I think they're going to outlive us, unfortunately. So thank you all for coming and uh, listening and spending, oh, slightly over time, but it's not too bad. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take them. I'm thinking what I might do is actually move out to the back because there's other people out there who will help us. But yeah, thank you for coming. What kind of, it's a protein, it's not a chemical. It's a mixture of proteins. And they're, basically they're enzymes, and when they get into the cell, they disrupt the way that the cell normally works and stop the cell from behaving like a normal cell. And like I said, they can't recruit, the cell no longer is able to recruit the immune system to come and help it out and kill the invading bacteria. So it's not, it's not a chemical, it's a protein, it's an enzyme. Um, I think what we'll do is, I'm sure they have, there are questions uh, about the talk. So there's Clyde, there's another four or five specialists out uh, waiting outside for you. So rather than asking all the questions in here, we have cookies out there and lots of other scientists. So if you'd like to go out and the thing. So thanks, Clyde. Once again. Thank you.